It's a weird thing seeing your wife was dead. It's even more terrifying when she grabs your leg from her grave. Hey, Clyde. Mayor, look at this. The sign that says... Fetid fields? Mortal danger. Proceed at your own risk. Oh, uh, bud. I don't know if we're meant to be here. Welcome back, travelers. It's episode 4 of season 2. Sorry it's been so long once again. On this week's show, we have the death of death, a close encounter with the police, immortality, someone in the right place at the wrong time, a sinister daughter, a stain, an insecure sister, and a watcher. I'm going to die here. That's a normal way to think about it, right? It's cold, and it's dark, and I can't feel anything anymore. He took my only possible weapon against what is out there, slowly surrounding me. Maybe I should start somewhere else. Maybe I should explain better. I am death. I guide the souls of the departed to their afterlives. It isn't what anyone would tell you. Whatever you believe is waiting for you after, that's what will be there. It's a system that has been around for as long as I can remember. The only danger is the path between everything that leads to your personal ending. I am the one meant to be guiding souls to those ends. The most recent soul, my last one, my final one, he was a serial killer. He believed he was going to hell. I was taking him to what he had imagined after so many years of being on the run. The whispers in the darkness have always been the worst part of the job. Guiding souls through the darkness and hearing the voices in the void. That has always frightened me a little. I kept quiet about it, did my duty. Felt fear rise inside of me. He listened to them. He attacked me used my own tool against me, left me here in the darkness. And now I am dying. Death can indeed die, it seems. And I'm afraid, truly afraid. I can't make myself stand up. I can't get together the strength to hunt him down and protect both the dead and the living. The voices in the dark are growing louder. And death can no longer protect you. Sitting in the Dark was written by Krasma Mal and narrated by Puka. Ugh, who could it be? I looked at my phone. 11.37. I don't think I've ever had someone come to my door so late. Well, not since college. Those years are behind me now. I got off the couch made my way to the front of the house. I started to get scared. Who could it be? I don't have a gun or anything, in case it's a criminal. I look through the peephole and see red and blue lights. I think it's a cop. Not much better if you ask me. Hello, sir. Sorry to bother you at such a late hour, but I wanted you to know that there has been a kidnapping in this neighborhood. That's terrible. Can I help in some way? We just want to keep the parents informed. Best to stay alert in these trying times. This is the third time in the past year. Have you checked on your kids tonight? 
How would he know I have kids? Sorry, sir, but I live alone. Why did you think I have kids? I'm in the neighborhood on patrol a lot. I thought I saw kids here before. Sorry for the misunderstanding, but now you know to be on the lookout. Something about this guy seemed off. Do you not have a partner, officer? I thought most cops worked in pairs. It's just for TV shows. Most of us work alone. Well, I'll get out of your hair, sir. Again, sorry to bother you. No problem. Enjoy your night, officer. Before I could close the door, he grabbed the doorknob. If you don't mind my asking, could you point me to the houses around here where the kids might live? Don't want to bother any more single households. Now this guy was really giving off bad vibes. Something told me not to tell him. But on the off chance he was helping, I thought I should help. The house next to mine on the right, and across the street with the two cars in the driveway. That's all I know. Thank you. That makes all of this easier on me. And like that, the officer left. I checked my phone. 147. I was used to these knocks late at night, however. That's because they didn't come from my front door. It's much better to store kids in the basement. That way, the cops can't hear them. The Cop by Reddit user Le French Chemist. Narrated by David Dodd. Featuring Minkus Thormine. Take care now, Father would say, and take no heed on the fairies in the well. Father was a simple man. He believed in Jesus, the value of hard work, and in his guaranteed providence. He was not a man of tall tales or given to falsehoods. His word was iron. Yet, he believed in fairy folk. He was convinced they infested the hedges and gardens and fields that surrounded our farm. They're bred for mischief, he would grumble. He was most afraid of the fae in the well. He warned my brother and I at length to stay away, terrified they would drag us up to their castles underground, coaxing us with milk and honeyed words. Father's crazy. Ben spat through the gap in his teeth. The barn door took for his arrogance. Henry says his pa and the men in town call father crazy. What? Father ain't crazy? Oh yeah. How'd you get so noble? He just wants us to be safe, is all. He's full of shit. Hush up. He'll get us with the belt. Yeah, cause he don't want us knowing we know. You're crazy, Ben. I ain't, and I know there ain't no such thing as fairies. I bit back tears. I knew Ben was mad Father whipped him for stealing cigarettes, but hated I couldn't argue his point. We spent hours in the field and saw not high nor hair of Faye. Let's take a look at that well. I shuddered. The father says it's dangerous. It'll prove whether he's crazy or ain't. We crept out that night after we said our prayers and father had gone to bed. The moon hung like a god in the sky, lightening the chalky tracks to the old well. Ben and I gripped the weathered slats that covered the mouth, tossed them aside, and stared in. It went forever down, the dark hypnotizing. Ben whispered, Hey, any fairies in there? In the response, he chuckled <laughs> as I tugged on his shirt. Come on, let's get back inside. He shooed me off, took a rock, and tossed it in. 
it kicked off the walls before hitting with a splash somewhere below. He called down, louder. Anyone down there? I can see you, little boy. Both of us stopped still, stunned. Ben called down again. Who's that there? I can see you, little boy. Come down. See to us. We juddered like leaves, eyes wide. I leaned in. Are y'all fairies? No, boy. Come to us. Hurry. Who are you? There is no time. Ben fished something out of his pocket. Father's lighter. My eyes popped wide. Ben, what are you? He flicked it on and tossed it down. At the bottom of the well were no less than ten or twelve women, emaciated, eyes hollowed, hair limp, raw-boned zombies. Mud caked their faces, making them look ghoulish. They begged. Please, before he comes back. Behind us, I heard the sound of boots on chalk. Fairies in the Well was written by J. Justin Graham and narrated by Dean and Molly from the Road Tripping Podcast. Speaking of the Road Tripping Podcast, please listen to the promo here and go follow them. They're good friends of the podcast. So, go, go, go. Come on, move already. Ah, uh, so slow. I am going to be late again. Does this sound like your typical commute? The boss is gonna kill me. Sure, just cut me off, you- Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Let's be family friendly here. Wait, who said that? That's not really important. Would you like your commute a lot less disastrous? Yeah, I could use that. Well then, let me adjust your dial. <laughs> Introducing the Road Tripping Podcast. Just sit back and relax while our hosts Dean and Molly entertain you with trivia, history, true crime, the paranormal, and much, much more. All in the hopes that your commute will suck just a little less. In early 1916, the German army decided to launch an offensive against France's symbol of national pride, Verdun, knowing they would defend it to the last. They planned to simply inflict massive casualties in order to bleed France white. The following is a recovered and translated excerpt from the journal of a French soldier who fought at Verdun. February 22nd, 1916. News has come that my entire battalion is being transferred south to Verdun to defend against the new German offensive. My sector has been quiet, so I'm looking forward to a chain in scenery. Hell, I've heard it's, I've heard it's a beautiful town, and its fortifications are supposedly magnificent. Anything is better than being stuck here. We begin our march tomorrow morning. Although I am excited, I am somewhat scared. Our commander's tone detailed the ominous foreboding. I plan to live through this war, and I ought to have some story to tell. March 2nd, 1916. Je ne suis ACQ. I've only been here for three days, and I am terrified. Today I was woken by the screams of one of the men on watch. He had been hit by shrapnel. He stumbled down the trench, hunched over and weeping, begging for his mother to save him. His uniform had been torn up and he was bleeding profusely, and he had a large splinter stuck into his shoulder. Take it out, take it out, take it out, he pled. He turned towards me and I saw his face, or what remained of it. His mangled features looked hardly human. His right eye was mutilated and the socket looked almost empty. Yet it was full of blood and metal. When I made 
contact with his working eye, all I saw was an expression of hopeless misery. We tried to get him to a filled hospital, but he was dead before we even got halfway. March 19, 1916. The horrific novelty of my newfound home has been replaced by simple boredom. We sit and wait for attacks that do not come, yet we are still too weak to attack. We have little to entertain ourselves and even less to talk about. Discussions of what await us at home, whether that be family, sleep, food, or woman, have petered out as they simply make us more miserable. We are often left in reflection, daydreaming about home life or thinking about those who have been killed. The few friends I've made are either silent or dead, so we lie here, fatigued and bored. Kiridashi will get us killed, so we often s are sitting or lying down, staring into space, imagining better times. It's not if it's not as if all of our senses have gone numb, though. The smell is unbearable. The rats, both dead and alive, have a repulsive order, and they are new, too numerous to stop. The corpses that we've yet to recover have begun to rot and reek. Their smell begins to slowly seep into our uniforms that, even when we are on leave, we cannot escape the front. My hearing has been weakened, but if my friends speak loudly, I can steer heal them. I am still able to see and to touch, but I wish that I could no longer taste. The food tastes like shit. March 30th, 1916. We've been under fierce bombardment for nearly two days now. I haven't slept and I've hardly eaten. My friend's eyes are bloodshot and their expressions grim. I'm sure I look the same way. The worst part is I can hardly even remember who I am. Sure, I have my memories, but they feel fragmented and meaningless. Any thoughts of peace and calm, if not interrupting by more shelling, are cut short by the shrieks of horses and the wailings of wounded men. Occasionally their batteries have a direct hit on one of our dugouts, causing it to collapse. We rush in, despise the danger, and uh, try to dig dig the occupants out, but usually you're, we're too late and they suffocate. We're supposed to be safe in these. We're overwhelmed by weariness. A few days ago, we had to partake in a small raid to try to capture prisoners and look for weak points. When I arrived at their trench, I was faced to face with a young German who was just leaving his dugout. When he saw me, he backed into a wall and stammered some words that I did not know. He began to reach into his coat for a knife. He looked like a scared child. I couldn't bring myself to shoot him, but my lieutenant could. He told me I was a goddamn coward, and I had no response. When their sentry sounded the alarm, we climbed out of their trench as fast as we could taking a wounded German with us. They fired at us as we escaped. Out of the 15 men that I left with, only six made it back. April 9th, 1916. It is monotonous, the shelling, that is. I can almost tune out the constant drumming sound going on above my dugout, but it is slightly too loud. It is wearing me down, but I am still standing. I am one of the lucky ones, though. Some of us have been not only broken, but shattered. The fragments are then dispersed, leaving a shallow hole where their brain used to be. Their expressions go blank and their eyes become devoid of life. But their trembling suggests they are really under an abject terror. 
They are possessed, but not by any ghost or ghoul. But they can simply no longer control themselves. Their incoherent mumbling combined with the occasional sobbing are the only noises they make. They seem to have gone crazy, but really they are just in shock. Usually we would try and get them from get them behind the front lines, but the bombardment makes it too dangerous. Our attempts to cover them have failed, so we simply leave them be. <coughs> Those who are on wire cutting duty were in the most danger. Once they were wounded, we are unable to save them and save them until the shelling subsides. They know it is hopeless, but they still cry for help. Even if the artillery has cleared up by nighttime, we still can't find them despite their screams. They suffer throughout the night and are usually dead by morning. By the time we have recovered their bodies, the rats have often eaten much of their faces and torso. They have become unrecognizable. We bury them in a shallow grave behind the lines, say a prayer, and then retreat back into our dugouts. The mo monotony of it all has dumbed down my emotions. All I feel now is apathy. April 15th, 1916. I was on sentry guard duty today. I was able to get back underground once the artillery began to rain down upon us. Many of my friends weren't so lucky. As the shelling reached Consendo, I looked around at the faces of my comrades and then at myself. We are the dead, having drowned in our despair. Our abject misery left us little room to think, so our minds sat empty. When we were on leave only yesterday, we were able to laugh and our spirits were calm. That is... inconceivable now. Only a short while ago, we were able to love and be loved, to watch the sunrise and set, to laugh and cry and to live. But we've run out of tears to shed, and silence has taken the place of humor. As children, we feared monsters under our bed with sharp teeth and red eye. But the real monsters are the huge metal beast a few kilometers away, where whose fangs plunge into the dirt around us, and we do fear them. We were taught to hate and fear the devil and his company, but who would have guessed that they would be our own commanders? April 22nd, 1916. Today we were able to repel the Germans, and I hated every minute of it. First came the bombardment, and with it came the gas. I've survived gas attacks before, but my sergeant wasn't so lucky today. His mask had been punctured by shrapnel, and he didn't realize it. We tried to help him, but it was too late. The, his wails were muffled as his throat began to close. His eyes withered back and forth in despair, and he desperately gasped for air. We said our prayers as the life left his eyes. When we finally, finally went over the top, we were ready. It was a massacre. Rows of men stood up in courage and might, only to fall seconds later. As they neared us, some got stuck in our wire. Only a few meters in front of me, I saw one German struggle to free himself as his leg was, was tangled up. He fell forward into the wire, tearing apart his uniform and its face. As he stood, he looked at me with his newly deformed face. Pure terror went into his eyes. I shot him right then and there because I thought it was my duty. But it was really a glorified murder. I had promised God in my young youth that I would never kill a man, as it was one of his commandments. 
My newfound guilt left me paralyzed, but my promises of youth cannot restrict me here, for I am no longer young. Even though that was mere months ago, I am old now. As they realize the futility of their assault, they begin to retreat, but not all of them made it. I've been told that all of the Germans are barbaric sons of bitches and ought to all be dead. Few of us took, us took it to heart, but even fewer openly disputed it. As they retreated, one of their wounded men was on his knees in a shade of extreme hysteria and shock. The unarmed man was putting his hands up and down over and over again as if he was in prayer. Somebody said, shoot that son of a bitch, and somebody did. Seems to me that the Germans weren't the only ones committing atrocities. May 1st, 1916. I think I may be able to finally leave this godforsaken place. Over one third of my battalion is either killed, captured, wounded, or missing. So we get to leave soon. But we are still expected to join the attack tomorrow morning. I think if I survive this, then I may be able to survive the war. I must not get my hopes up though. The attack seems bleak and the enemy looks strong. Although I have survived, I am broken. We are broken. My friends, if they are not already dead, are shadows of their former selves. Their souls seem to have left their bodies. My childhood and family back home seem imaginary, not real. But even if it is not here at Verdun, where will it be? Will I have to suffer the same fate just in some new place? I am unsure about the existence of God after this. No benevolent deity would ever let this happen, but I will still pray. Even then, I don't know if I will be able to recover. My mind is shattered, my memory is worthless, and my conscience dull. Though writing has helped me before, I cannot ever see myself wanting to look back at this. Yet, why would somebody else want to read it? To sympathize with me? I cannot comprehend it. I once arrogantly wrote that I wanted to have some story to tell, but no one wants to hear this story. I've buried my friends here. I've watched them die. I've watched myself die. I am simply a walking corpse. This was the final entry in his journal. Although he survived Verdun, he died in the Chemin des Dames in an offensive the following year. Che decorum est pro patria mori. They shall not grow old was written by Rolf sixty six and was narrated by Dr. Creepin and Jack Sanders. It is summer, obviously, and pools are the unavoidable siren call to toddlers, teens, and grown men who want to show off years of unshaven chest hair alike. The stench of chlorine is an instant entrancing and hypnotic beckon that pulls up foggy memories of summer's past like an expired Polaroid. Even now as you picture this, you hear the yelps of children being tossed into the pool and the whistle of the lifeguard as someone thinks they can sneak in a cannonball. He's not looking, they'll say. But he always is. And he always blows that whistle just before they can enter the water. Ugh, the water. Don't get me started on the water. Here in the northeast, it is regularly pushing up 90s with damn near 100% humidity and... That water, warm and piss infested as it may be, it's a sanctuary. So cooling causing instant relief from the harsh rays of the August sun, cannonballs and splashing, dunking yourself under the water to be fully encompassed, 
hanging out with friends and family alike with the occasional smell of nearby barbecue as it penetrates the sickly chemical bath's aurora of stench. What then is the problem? My town doesn't have a pool. I don't have a pool. My friends certainly don't have a pool. Yet we have these memories of spending time in the pool. Mine just as vivid as yours. Everything I wrote above comes from my memories, my summers, my childhood for Pete's sake. My parents don't remember the town's pool being installed, nor do my grandparents or my friends' parents and grandparents. The pool doesn't exist in any public record that I could find. Yet, so vividly and easily can I remember how to get there. But in the off-season, there isn't anything there. It can't be found. I tried to talk to people here and they think I'm crazy. Of course there is a pool. Just about the whole town uses it. The whole town? Isn't that strange? I did some digging, by which I mean I pulled up Google Maps and looked around, and to my surprise, no one in my town has a pool. Certainly, Sarah's family has the land and money for one, or the Jeffersons who basically built the town. Surely, they could afford the pool. In what suburban town anywhere in America is it impossible to find a pool? Maybe Alaska? Maybe Arizona is just straight up too hot to be outside like that for all I know. But the East Coast, away from the claustrophobia that the city instills, surely someone would have a pool. But there isn't. Not a public pool, nor a private pool to be found, and yet at noon, just about everyone that I can picture from the town will be marching, towels in hand, to the public pool. The whistles, the reek of chemicals, and the sweet, sweet relief of water all calls us to relax and unwind away from the woes of our daily lives. And that's the problem there. Why does a pool that doesn't exist call to us so? And maybe more importantly, what does it want from us? Does your town have a pool? Does it really? Does your community have its own pool? Consider not using it. Written by Unyielding Glass. Performed by Joshua McMahon. Why won't mommy get out of bed? It's morning now. The sun is up. She should be up too, making breakfast or at least getting ready. But instead, she stays in her room. The door shut, the lights turned off. It makes me curious. I go to her door, open it a little. It's dark, but I can see her, wrapped up in covers like a cocoon. Mommy? I whisper. She doesn't answer. Mommy? She doesn't even move. I know Mommy loves me very, very much. That's what makes me curious. If she loves me, why does she stay in bed all morning, not answering when I call? But then I think, maybe she's sick. Maybe she's hurt. Now I'm worried. I open the door a little bit further. Quietly, I sneak inside. The air in Mommy's room smells funny. It's hard to see where I'm going. I move real slow and quiet and careful. Soon I'm at the bed. I say, Hi, Mommy. I wait. Nothing. Up close, I can see she's lying on her side. Away from me. Her covers only go to her shoulders. I see her back freckles. Her curly red hair. I poke her. Hello? Are you sleeping? I'm going to say other stuff too, but then I hear it. <laughs> it sounds kind of like a puppy, or maybe a baby rabbit when you give it an apple slice. It's a happy sound for animals, but it's sad when mommy makes it. It means she's crying. Mommy? I say, 
Are you sad? Are you sick? Still, she doesn't answer. Now I'm mad. I'm mad because this time I know Mommy's awake. She's ignoring me. Even if you're crying, you shouldn't ignore someone. That's rude. All at once, I jump on the bed. It's not a nice thing to do, but I'm really, really mad. I grab Mommy's arm and pull her toward me. Then I get up real close and say, Listen carefully, you ungrateful bitch. I've been very fucking patient with you. I make my scariest frown as I hold her face to mine. She feels so small, my hands fit easily around her neck. It would have been easy for me to kill your children. When I took you, I could have slashed their throats as well. But I held back as a gesture of goodwill so that you'd accept your new home, so that you'd learn your role. You must always remember, you have a role to play here. And you'd better put some heart into it because there's nothing stopping me from strolling back to that pretty white house and finishing the fucking job. It's quiet for a while after that, like we're both in time out. But suddenly, I'm not mad anymore. I look at mommy. Her eyes are red, but she's not crying. I think we're okay. I say, Mommy, will you brush my hair? Okay, sweetie. And after that, pancakes? Okay. Why Won't Mommy Get Out of Bed was written by Pretty Creepy and narrated by Erica Letitia and Sinister Sweetheart. Father always put my cherry juice in my favorite cup, the dinosaur cup. It was my favorite because the color of the dinosaur would change as the juice went. I loved slurping down cherry juice watching Looney Tunes on a Saturday morning. The sugar made me surge, and I'd laugh over and over at the silly cartoons gleaming into my eyes. On Halloween night, after trick-or-treating, I laid on the living room carpet and drank out of my dino cup, watching the horror Looney Tunes special. I must have fallen asleep because a loud bang from the TV shook me awake. I flung my arms around and smacked the cherry juice over, spilling the juice on the floor and covering the white carpet blood red. I started sobbing. I remember being so scared because my father would be so mad about what I had done. He wouldn't be a happy father today. My eyes in his hands, I'm dripping with tears. I turn to look over for my father, but he isn't in the kitchen anymore. I get up and shout his name out. Nothing. Again. Nothing. That's when I walk over to the stairs and sprint up like the roadrunner. I stop, look down at the floor, cherry red. The white carpet was stained in cherry red. The stain went down the hallway and there was father sleeping. I thought, it's okay. Father made a stain too. The Stain was written by Jump Rope is a Sport and was narrated by Sinister Sweetheart. She came to me every day. She told stories about her new friends, the shenanigans at school, her quest to become noticed by her crushed and idolized by the school. Boys. I blame the movies. She'd always like them. Though mom always said that she looked up to me. Though mom always said she looked up. Though mom always said she looked up to me. Though mom always said that she looked up to me. I knew better. I tried to warn her, but she didn't listen. She never really had. Lila said. Lila, I don't think... She was already up and waving goodbye. I waved back, shoulders dropping. It's a good idea, I finished, trailing off as she left. The next day, she was in her cheerleader uniform, mine previously, but it fit her nicely now. She was talking to someone. Dread pooled in my chest cavity. James had been my ex-boyfriend when I was still in school. 
He would have graduated by now, but here he was, talking to my little sister. She had the largest smile on her face. How dare you? How dare you get so close? I was there in a flash, screaming her name so loud it was a roar in my ears. My hands reaching out to shove them away from each other. They never connected. The two were hurled far and wide like a puppet string had yanked them to the very opposite ends of the earth. Like rag dolls, they flew and crashed. They didn't move. Oh, Lila. I whispered, quivering, life go quivering like a leaf. I felt sick. He was pronounced dead. My sister lay in a coma. I'm so sorry, Lila. I didn't want you to end up like me, dead, and in a hole with your flowers still on my gravestone, while he still has the scratches I made while he choked me into oblivion. My Sister Wanted to Be Popular was written by user Zoo Hames on the Short Scary Stories subreddit and narrated by Sinister Sweetheart. When I was young, my mother told me not to stare. I'm sure most people's parents do the same at some point, but I was a stubborn case. I couldn't really help myself. I love to watch people in restaurants and bookstores, on the beach, anywhere. It was just the most interesting thing, and I couldn't pull myself away. People interest me. They always have. It's not a sexual thing. I just love watching people go about their daily lives. Seeing them get coffee, witnessing them chat with one another while they walk their dogs. It was thrilling to me to know that they were their own little microorganism, independent and ignorant of the world around them, if just for a second. Watching people became a part of my daily life. It was my escape, my hobby. It was fun. Lately, when I watch one of the cafe patrons, I catch a peek at his jaundiced, reptilian eyes and scaly hands followed by a filthy scowl in my direction. I glimpse the spade tongue and its fangs on the librarian before she sneers at me like she smells something bad. I spy wolfish hair on my boss's neck and hands before he turns and goes to eat his lunch farther away from me. Gills on the corner store clerk, the red irises of my friend's mother, the spider like maul on my history professor. Take my advice. Don't make a habit of people watching. I can hear a too polite knock on my apartment door, even though it's four in the morning. It's just one knock, but I can see a collection of numerous twisted shadows through the frosted glass window. If you watch for long enough, you'll start to see things you shouldn't. And someone will start watching back. Voyeurism was written by Prophetic Dreams Trash on Reddit.com and narrated by Sir Soothing Voice. I heard my daughter calling out my name from the bedroom. Just before I pushed the door, I remembered I don't have a daughter. My fetid friend, I want to thank you for listening, and I hope to see you again very soon in my fields. This audio production is copyrighted by Scarecrow Tales. No copying or reproduction is permitted without the prior written permission of Scarecrow Tales. The copyrights of each story are held by the respective authors.